Hello and welcome to Cup of Cosmology, the place for all your questions about the universe. My name is Diana Hooper and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently at the Helsinki Institute of Physics over in the University of Helsinki in Finland. And I'm a cosmologist, so that means that I study the universe, the contents of the universe, how things evolve, how things interact, basically what is happening inside the universe. It's a great topic. I love being a cosmologist. I love getting to study the cool things happening in space, out, out there in the universe. And I love chatting to everybody about all of the cool things I get to research. <coughs> so hello to everybody joining. Great to see some of the regulars here and welcome if you're a first time viewer. Paul is saying that it's blurry. Uh, please do let me know if it's blurry for everyone or if that's a localized issue. For me, the video feed seems fine. Uh, but if it's blurry for everybody, then I can see if it's a problem on my end that I can fix. So do let me know if there's problems with the image quality for other people as well. So if um, if you're a regular viewer, you know how this works. This is an interactive stream. The idea here is that you can ask me anything you want about space, about the universe, about cosmology, about physics, about life in Finland, basically anything you want. It, it's all set up now. Perfect. Th thanks for confirming that, Paul. Glad, glad it's working now. It's, it's always worrying when there are issues for some people, but glad it's glad it's smooth now. So if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to the Cup of Cosmology YouTube channel, leave a comment, like the video, do all of the usual YouTube things, ring the notification bell. You know how YouTube works. Press all the buttons that make stuff happen. It's very cool. Get buttons to press. Really does help with engagement and helps me get my streams out to more people. So I do appreciate everyone who does that and everyone who, you know, advertises my streams on Twitter or wherever. Do really appreciate all of the engagement from everyone. So yeah, I'm, I'm a cosmologist, I'm a theoretical physicist, I study the universe, cool stuff happening inside the universe, and I love chatting to people about cool stuff happening in cosmology. And, you know, most weeks I, um, I start the stream with like, I don't have a topic today, let's see where you want to go. Often I get asked the question of what's new in cosmology, and usually my answer is like, well, you know, we're just... We're just gradually moving along. Stuff is happening slowly, as always in science, slow and gradual progress. So this week is exciting. This week is different. I have three things to talk to you about, and they are all three things that are happening within the next week. So between now and next Sunday, there are three things happening that may or may not be significant for cosmology. I'm, I'm leaning towards will be significant for cosmology. So lots of cool stuff to happen today. And as always, this is an interactive stream, so feel free to ask questions. As always, feel free to derail me into different topics. It's always fun. Three things that I want to talk about today. One of them involves dark matter and dark energy. One of them involves gravitational waves, so we're covering my favorite topics already. And the other one probably involves neutrinos or should involve neutrinos. Cool stuff, lots of, lots of cool things to talk about. And Obviously, this week is going to be build up. Next week's stream is going to be discussing what's happened during the week. So uh, lots of school stuff happening and, and it's going to be fun. So again, welcome, to, welcome back to all of the regulars. Great to see everybody here. As always, welcome to first time viewers. Always, always nice to have everybody here. So three topics I want to cover and I'm going to get started with the first one that David Dunn has already mentioned here in the comments. Uh, somehow you, either YouTube or your phone keeps defaulting to lower resolution. Yeah, I, it, it might be some setting on your YouTube that if you're on data and not on Wi-Fi to reduce the lower resolution to, to not use as much data. I know there is a setting like that somewhere, but otherwise not sure. If you see the video blurry, just increase the resolution on YouTube. It should, should be fine. Okay, so we're going to talk about one of my favorite things. And despite what people might think, we are not talking about the CMB today. But in any case, here's your CMB less than five minutes in. So the universe has three main components, everything we see, everything we are accustomed to, everything from the stars you see at night in the night sky to me, to my tea mug. All of this is normal matter. Normal matter only accounts for 5% of the energy budget of the observable universe. Then there's a big chunk, 26%, which is in the form of dark matter. <coughs> so dark matter is this weird type of matter that is holding everything together. It interacts via the gravitational force, but it doesn't interact electromagnetically, which means dark matter is invisible. But we know that it's there due to its gravitational effect on everything else. Less than five minutes for the CMB today, breaking records. And then the remaining 68% is in the form of dark energy. Dark energy is this weird type of energy that is driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. It's pushing everything outwards. 
And that's pretty much everything we know about dark energy for now. So some of you who have been here before might have heard me talk about the Euclid spacecraft. The Euclid spacecraft is an upcoming mission by the European Space Agency that is going to that is hailed as a successor to Planck. So Planck is the one that gave us the CMB. It was the biggest European Space Agency mission. At some point, NASA was involved as well. This is the biggest European Space Agency space-based mission we've had to date. The next one, the successor, is Euclid. Now, Euclid is a spacecraft that is designed to unlock the secrets of dark matter and dark energy. What Euclid is going to do is it's going to measure the position and the shape and the redshift of galaxies. So redshift basically gives you an idea of how quickly something is moving. Euclid is going to measure the distance, the shape, and the redshift of galaxies looking back in time to 10 billion years ago. So it's going to peer into when the universe was only 3 billion years old. This, the universe currently is 13 billion, 13.8 billion years old. Euclid is going to look 10 billion of years into the past. And it's going to basically create a map of galaxies throughout cosmic evolution. So we know that the further back, the further away we look, the further back in time we're looking. So if we can look at galaxies that are close by, then galaxies that are a bit further away and a bit further and a bit further, we can basically get snapshots of the history of galaxy formation and evolution. What galaxies looked like 10 billion years ago, what they look like today, and everything in between. The reason this is so important is we know that dark matter is the glue that holds galaxies together. But because the universe is expanding, it's going through accelerated expansion, this the, the way galaxies look, the like network of galaxies, the cosmic web of galaxies is going to be distorted over the history of the universe because of the expansion rate of the universe, because of the accelerated expansion. Which means mapping the, the history of the evolution and position of galaxies not only can tell us about dark matter, it can tell us about dark energy. So it can help us understand how dark matter is behaving now, how dark matter behaved in the past, and what dark energy is doing to galaxies. So Euclid is considered by many people to be the make or break of our standard cosmological model, because it is either going to measure what we expect it to measure, or it's not going to, and then we need to go back to the drawing board. So Euclid is an amazing space-based mission that has had many, 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 many years of built up. Is Euclid sufficiently old to not trigger your don't name science things after people preference? In general, I would not name spacecrafts or buildings or anything after people. You know, name them after collaborations or after phenomena, but naming them after people, you just always open yourself up to, to problematic issues. I much prefer when we do things like this is a very large telescope. It's called very large telescope. This is a square kilometer away. We call it square kilometer away. I like names like that. Descriptive names are useful. So Euclid, here is an artist's rendition of what Euclid is going to look like. This is the Euclid spacecraft. It is kind of big, kind of heavy. And Euclid is ready for launch. So this is Euclid up here, or what it's going to look like. Artist's impression of Euclid. So Euclid was supposed to launch at the end of 2022 in autumn last year. It was supposed to launch on a Russian rocket because of everything happening in the world right now. This was postponed and scrapped. And the launch date was postponed. Mathematically, are there galaxies that are already too far away to ever study because of the expansion of the universe? Absolutely. Because the universe is undergoing accelerated expansion, there are things that are constantly moving so far away from us that they will never, ever have time to send us information. They are so far away that the light they emit will never reach us. Now, imagine the universe is expanding. Things are gradually moving further and further and further away. Imagine if you're in a stream or in, in a river and you are swimming counter current. So the current is going one way and you're going the other. You know, if you drop, does that make sense? Yes. So you're going in opposite direction. You know, if you drop something in the water, you can still go and catch it. But at some point, it's going to be so far that even if you turn your boat around and chase after it, you're never getting that thing back. Right. So because the universe is expanding and this expansion is accelerating, there are galaxies that are being pushed beyond our, 
horizon beyond anything we'll ever be able to receive information of. So there are parts of the universe that are completely gone for us forever. And as the expansion rate of the universe increases, it could be that someday everything is going to be out of reach for us. This is what is known as the big freeze or the heat death, where everything is so far away that we'd look up into the night sky and nothing, nothing would be looking back, no stars, nothing in the night sky. It would be amazing. We Humans will be long gone by then, but it is a potential possibility in the future. However, back onto Euclid. Euclid was supposed to launch end of last year. <coughs> this was scrapped, this was postponed. We were told Euclid was going to launch this summer. So up until very recently, I had in mind Euclid was going to launch sometime in July. That was the window they had given us, July. July 2023, Euclid will launch. And last week, they announced the first attempt they're going to... So the current launch date. Euclid is set to launch on the 1st of July, which is six days away. It is next Saturday. It is like basically now. I am not emotionally prepared for this. Euclid is going to launch in six days, Saturday, 1st of July, at about, I think their, their launch window opens at five o'clock in the afternoon, Central European time, which should be 11 o'clock in the morning if you're on the west, if you're on the east coast, eight o'clock in the morning if you're on the west coast. The, um, yeah, they, the, the first launch window is in six days. If something goes wrong on the 1st of July, like, the weather or whatever gets in the way of the launch, they'll try again on the 2nd of July. So we went from Euclid is going to launch at some point over the summer to Euclid is launching in six days. Mark it in your calendar. I hope you're all ready. I am not ready for this. It is going to be amazing. This spacecraft has so much riding on it, so much amazing physics we're hoping to do. You know, if ever there's a moment to hide behind your sofa and, and, and watch the live stream, like watching a Dalek, you know, behind your sofa, this is the one to do that. I will be so stressed during the launch. Saturday next week, six days from now, Euclid will attempt to launch. It's going to be so fun and so amazing and so stressful. And as David Dunn was just telling us here, this is going to be something that is the satellite is going to be like two tons once it's up there. It's, it's big. It's heavy. There's a lot of stuff that needs to go right. And as with most of them, it's going to travel to the Lagrange point too. So the Lagrange points are nice points around the the orbit as Earth is orbiting the Sun. This is a two-body problem. You have Earth, you have Sun. Sorry, you have Sun, you have Earth. Earth is orbiting around the Sun. There are five points where the centrifugal force and the gravitational force kind of balance out. And these are good points to have a satellite because it doesn't require much energy to keep them there. One of them is no, they're called Lagrange points and they are named Lagrange 1, Lagrange 2, so on. Lagrange 2, if you have sun, okay, let's make the sun yellow, you have the Earth here. Lagrange point 2 is going to be here, so it's behind the Earth with respect to the sun. So it's like the other side of the Earth to where the sun is. Sun, Earth, Lagrange 2. This is a point that is very nice to have a satellite in because the Earth shields it from the sun, so it's able to cool down easier, and it stays in orbit there, and it's easy to launch things to. So, if all goes to plan, Euclid launches on July 1st. It will take 30 days to reach L2. During that time, they will gradually switch on all of the instruments. They will start the testing phase. They will start just making sure that things are doing what they're supposed to do, start to calibrate it. Then when Euclid reaches L2, there will be two months of trial, two months of configuring, setting up, making sure everything is as it should be. This is the, the kind of pre-science stage. So this takes us 30 days to get there, it takes us to end of July, two months, that's August and September, which means come October, we actually start taking data, we start the science run of Euclid. So we're three months away from Euclid actually taking data and starting to map galaxies in the night sky. This is amazing. Three, it's going to launch in six days, and three months from now, it will already start taking data. And then, if all, again, if all goes to plan, the satellite will work for six years. It's going to take six years of data. They are planning three major data releases. I'm not sure when the first one is going to be. The data will not be made gradually public as we go. It will, will be released in chunks. This is the same as what we did with Planck. So there will be three major data releases for Euclid. Euclid will launch 
first launch window is going to be Saturday, six days from now. I am so excited about this. 30 days to get to L2, two months of setting up, configuring, making sure everything is okay. And then we start taking data. It's going to run for six years. There will be three data releases, probably a year or two in, then a few more years in, and then at the end with all of the data cleaned and packaged and everything done. So uh, yeah, this is going to be really, really, really cool. It can indeed say hello to all the other satellites at the L2 point because we keep sending stuff to L2. The JWST is at L2, Planck was there, WMAP was there. It's just a nice place to dump our satellites. It's a convenient point. So yes, L2 is indeed where JWST is, it's where Planck is, it's where all of these are. And soon Euclid will be there as well. So launch should be on Saturday. If some, there's some weather or anything affecting the launch on Saturday, they will postpone it and try again on Sunday. And if they try on Sunday, that means the launch will basically happen an hour before my live stream. So yeah, you'll see me full on post Euclid launch either a day after or an hour after, depending how the launch goes. But this is super exciting. When I started my, my master's degree, people were talking about Euclid and like all the core things we could do with it. I have a paper that involves doing forecasts of what Euclid is going to do for us too, actually. Like one or two, one, two. I have at least one paper where we look at what Euclid is going to do for us. I can't remember if we included it in the second one in the end or not. I should know this. <laughs> so Euclid, I've, I've been hearing the hype about it for years. During my PhD, I was super hyped about Euclid. And now it's, it's ready to launch six days from now. We got a week notice. I was not ready for this. And you know, I was actually not even working when I saw the notice. I opened social media on, on Mastodon and I follow Euclid on Mastodon and there was a post with the, the tweet saying launch date 1st of July. I was like, oh, wow, I am not ready for this. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing. So 1st of July, six days from now, Euclid is going to launch, all being well. And I can't wait to see what it's going to tell us. And every time we launch a new satellite, we find things we didn't expect. We find cool new data, cool new things. It's going to be amazing. Euclid, six days from now, mark it in your calendars. You should all be aware of Euclid launching. It is an amazing thing to happen. But that is only one of three things that are happening this week. It's going to be a busy and intense week. Thank you for stopping by, David. Always nice to have you here as well. OK. If there are any questions about Euclid, now is the time to ask them before we change into another topic, which is going to be gravitational waves. So I'm going to give you all a sec to think about if you have Euclid questions. My tea is indeed still too hot to drink. So I'm giving you all a sec to think about Euclid questions, and then we move on to the second thing that's going to happen this week. Okay, I know you might all be typing questions too late. I know I don't give a big enough gap for questions. That is fine. We are going to move on to the second thing happening this week. And the second thing happening this week is related to gravitational waves. So just a very, very, very quick recap. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space time. In the same way that if you splash about in water, you create ripples of water. If you splash about in the universe in space time you will create ripples of space time which is amazing okay I, I see we do have some questions so let me go back to questions and then move on to gravitational waves and just hyping it up in the meantime hope beetlejuice beetlejuice going supernova this week that would be fun so beetlejuice is a, yeah, beetlejuice is a star that might go supernova at some point and it would be really cool if that happened during our lifetime and in fact, there was a paper recently that said that actually this might happen within the, within tens of years, so within decades. So we might someday see see it going supernova, but that is not something that we can predict already. So that is not something that we can say like it's going to go supernova this day. But it would be very cool if that were to happen. But yes, it would be very very nice to to have a supernova but it's probably unlikely. Have to respect Diana for realizing that dark matter is fake science and changing career focus. Ah, yeah, dark matter is the best model we have to explain everything we see in the universe. Until we find a better model, dark matter is the one that we have. So yeah, dark matter is here to stay until 
we find something better. If you find a model that can explain all of the data better than dark matter, then we'll move on. Um, my changing my, my research topic has nothing to do with how good or bad dark matter is. It's just that I, I get very excited by lots of random things and I found another cool idea to chase, so I'm doing that. But actually, I am working still on, a lot on dark matter. Euclid will be launching, I believe, from the US, from Cape Canaveral. At, um, yes, it should be launching from Cape Canaveral. And it will be launching on a Falcon 9. I think the launch site didn't change. It was still Cape Canaveral. But it was supposed to be on a Russian rocket. And now it's going to be on a Falcon 9 rocket. So uh, it is at Cape Canaveral, getting ready, probably loading onto the launch pad soon. So it will be launching from the US, hopefully on Saturday. Oh, OK. If we see Beetlejuice going supernova, it really happened many, many, many years ago. Yes, stars that we see in the night sky are very far away. If we see anything in the night sky, it happened a long time ago. If we see Beetlejuice go supernova, it's already happened. Uh, we have observed supernova before. There have been some events. There was one in 1978, I'm going to say. We have seen supernova before from different historical records. We know that it has happened multiple times. Um, we we expect that there's going to be like one dramatic supernova that we'll see in the night sky every hundred years. So we are kind of due for one, but you know that that's statistically one every hundred years approximately. So we do think based on some records that there was one in the 16th century, I think. We know there was one 1978, I believe, that we were able to see. So there have been supernova in the night sky. It's either 1978 or 1987, one of those. So we have seen supernova before. Um, the thing is, you can't really predict them. You can't schedule that in your calendar. Like, there's going to be a supernova tomorrow. Look up, you know, it will happen when it happens. And yeah. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. But it would be very nice, very cool if Beetlejuice goes supernova. But that's not something I can tell you. Add that to your calendar. When it happens, it happens. OK, so Beetlejuice, Euclid, we covered those questions. Da, da, da. OK, gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. They can be caused by basically anything that has acceleration that is moving through the universe. Yeah, I believe there was one just at the turn of the millennial, millennium, like a thousand years ago as well. There are records of some based on people describing like seeing a second sun in the sky. There are things that make us believe that there have been several supernovae that we have seen. So things that produce gravitational waves. If you have two black holes coming together and colliding, that's going to produce gravitational waves. If you have a small object falling into a supermassive black hole, that's going to produce gravitational waves. If you have two supermassive black holes smashing together, gravitational waves. Even supernova, because they're not perfectly symmetrical, can produce gravitational waves. So anything that has both acceleration and a lack of symmetry in the universe can produce gravitational waves. If I'm on my chair and I rotate perfectly slowly and symmetrically and at constant speed, I will not produce gravitational waves. But if I move chaotically, like moving my arms about spinning, I, would produ I am producing gravitational waves while well, I do this because there's acceleration and there's lack of symmetry. How different is Euclid from JWST in terms of data collection? So the type of data they're collecting is radically different. The things they're looking at are very different. The wavelengths they operate at are different. So um, they're, they're, they don't have overlapping goals. So JWST is focused on looking at individual stars and galaxies. Um, Euclid is more looking at the overall structure, large scale structure of the universe. So they are kind of uh, symbiotic. They look at different things. They're complementary, but they're not in any way overlapping. And the way the data is collected is different. And the JWST has a rolling data release because most NASA projects do, while Euclid will have data release in chunks instead of a gradual rolling release. As always, remember, there are no stupid questions on the show. You can always, always, always ask things. There are no stupid questions. If Betelgeuse goes supernova, what detector will realize it first? Infrared, light telescopes, gravitational waves. So probably pretty much at the same time, I think... I think when something goes supernova, so you get a star that collapses and expands as a supernova, explodes, you would probably see gamma ray first, and then it would very quickly shift across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. But I think uh, the visual one is the, is the one that would last longest. You'd also get a burst of 
neutrinos and if you're lucky a burst of gravitational waves as well so you get all three but i think the thing you measure first are the gamma rays and then gradually everything else but probably yeah i i would say that that would be my guess but don't quote me on that so Gravitational waves can be produced by a lot of things. Another thing that can produce gravitational waves is the universe itself. We know that the universe went through a period called inflation, or we think the universe went through a period of inflation where it grew exponentially in its infancy. And this is something that would be so dramatic that it could leave a background of gravitational waves everywhere in the universe. And this is amazing because if we ever measure these, it allows us to uncover what was happening in the early universe like fractions of a second after the end of inflation or after the big bang and it would be amazing to be able to measure these things and to understand these things and there are several different ways we can measure gravitational waves that we have the very ingenious idea of using lasers bouncing lasers back and forth between different detectors to see if there's anything changes the, the distance the laser is traveling and then you say okay something changed my distance probably a gravitational wave which changes space and time Oh, that is still hot. As always, I, I burn myself on my tea very easily. Okay, so there are several different ways we can detect gravitational waves. And I'm going to bring up this chart that I always bring up. Here you have a lot of information. So in the center, we have this red to purple gradient. This is just representing the different frequencies. And it's done in red to purple to mimic what we're accustomed to with light and the full spectrum of light. But it doesn't mean the gravitational waves have a color associated to them. On the left, you can see low frequency. On the right, you can see high frequency. What you can see at the top is the different things that can produce them. So for an example, you have rotating neutron stars, supernova. You have binaries in our own, <coughs> binaries in our own system. You have supermassive black holes smashing together. In red at the top, you can see we have these quantum fluctuations of the early universe. And then at the bottom, there's four panels showing us the different ways we can detect gravitational waves. Do I have any evidence that there are no stupid questions? It is my firm belief that there are no stupid questions. This is not something I have evidence for. This is just anecdotal. My own personal experience is that no one has ever asked me a stupid question on this show because I don't believe that stupid questions are a thing. They are just questions that are waiting to be asked. And it is one of the three rules of the show. There are actually rules on Cup of Cosmology. Be kind, be curious, no stupid questions. Those are the three rules. They're written on the webpage. Okay, so four different ways of detecting gravitational waves, as you can see here. On the one hand, we can use terrestrial interferometers. These are things like LIGO and Virgo. This is where you build an L shape, you bounce lasers back and forth, and you look for any tiny, tiny deviations. I've already talked at length about LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA and all of the amazing stuff they're doing. They are looking at neutron stars and black holes smashing together. They have already found 90 events in runs one, two, and three. And operating run four, operation run four started a few weeks ago in, in LIGO and they've already started to see a bunch of stuff. So that's cool. Going from right to left, the second one you can find here is space interferometers. This is LISA. This is where we take our L shape, make a triangle and send it to space. Um, this is what I'm working on. LISA is set to measure a bunch of things when it launches eventually in 15 years or so. It's going to be amazing. Then I'm going to jump one and go to the far left. We can use a cosmic microwave background radiation itself. The CMB, this afterglow that we have from the early universe, can be used to look for gravitational waves. Because if you have early universe gravitational waves, they could leave an imprint in the way the photons move in the CMB. So you can use that. And now the one I skipped, the one that I've never talked about on the show, or not much, and which is the one I'm going to be talking about today. Pulsar timing array. You see it here. It's the th third one from the right, second from the left. Pulsar timing array. And if you look at the region where it covers, it covers two different types of gravitational wave signals, supermassive black holes smashing together, and quantum fluctuations from the early universe. So what is pulsar timing array? Let's break it down. First of all, what are pulsars? So pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars. A neutron star is just a very, very, very dense star with magnetic fields. Pulsars are these stars that start to rotate. Because of the magnetic field, they're going to channel anything around them into a light beam. So if you have a pulsar, you have a light beam coming out the top and at the bottom. 
A polter is a rapidly rotating neutron star with a light beam coming out of each direction. This means that they can be used as the cosmic lighthouses. They are spinning constantly. So the, the, the pulsar can shine at you, turn around, shine at you again, turn around. They are the cosmic lighthouses. And one cool thing about pulsars is that we know how quickly they spin. This is something that, based on all the pulsars we've been able to observe, we know with very, very, very precise, very small error bars, very incredible accuracy, the rotation rate, the frequency with which these pulsars spin. These are often referred to as cosmic clocks or cosmic lighthouses, depending who you ask. But they are so precise, they can be used for timekeeping in the universe. If you know there's a pulsar there, based on how quickly the pulsar is spinning around, you can use that to measure time. Like, okay, the pulsar is spinning at this rate. I know it. I know what the pulsar is doing. And based on how quickly the light is hitting you, you can figure out if anything has happened. And you can also use something known as millisecond pulsars, which are pulsars that spin so quickly, they spin multiple times a second, they spin milliseconds, you're zipping around. This makes them incredibly precise. What exactly are quasars? Quasars are extremely active galaxies. So the difference between a pulsar and a quasar is basically the, the size. A quasar is a whole galaxy, or like the, the, cent the active, the center of a galaxy that is very active. We believe there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. A quasar is something that forms around this. Also has the jet, so, so that's where the confusion might come from. But there we're talking about galaxies that are rotating with jets, whereas a pulsar is one star that is rotating. Well, often you get two pulsars together. Millisecond pulsars zip around really, really, really quickly. If you have enough pulsars and you know how quickly they should be spinning, what you can do is measure multiple pulsars and see if any of them are spinning out of sync. And if they are, maybe a gravitational wave passed in between. Remember, gravitational wave is the distortion of space and time. When we're using lasers, we're looking at how quick uh, light, because we know that light is always traveling at the speed of light. So based on how long light takes to travel its path, you can figure out if there's any changes in distances. If you have a population of pulsars, like an array of pulsars, for an example, based on these, how precisely they spin, how you know, you know how precisely they should be spinning. If you look at enough of them, you might see a pattern of disturbance. Like this one's out of sync. No, this one's out of sync. No, this one's out of sync. And this could be a gravitational wave. So you can use pulsars to measure gravitational waves, which is really, really, really cool. How do we measure pulsars? We use radio, radio astronomy. So if a pulsar equation and a black hole and a neutron star get into a fight, who would win? Depends on the type of fight, but absolutely a quasar. A quasar is just ridiculously massive and big and can kill a whole galaxy. In fact, the Korskazak YouTube channel just put out a video a couple of weeks ago called the, the Galaxy Killers, and it's about quasars. So absolutely do not pick a fight with a quasar. I mean, don't pick a fight with a black hole either, but definitely don't pick a fight with a quasar. So I, I think confused because they both end in ideas. Pulsars, quasars, and they both spin around. So it's, it's easy to mix them up. But pulsar timing array is the idea of looking at an array of pulsars, so a group of pulsars using radio telescopes, which picks up this light beam that it's emitting, or this, this uh, electromagnetic radiation that the pulsar is emitting. You can pick that up in the radio frequency, which means you can use radio telescopes to measure pulsars and in turn use that to measure gravitational waves. How cool is that, that you're using pulsars, rapidly rotating neutron stars to measure gravitational waves? Amazing. There are several missions ongoing to use pulsar timing arrays. There's Nanograv in the US. There is a European one, which name I'm currently forgetting. What was the European one again? I'm just going to recheck the names because I should remember the names and the names are currently eluding me. So Nanograv is the American one. That one I remember. There is obviously the European Pulsar Timing Array because we're great with naming things. There is the Parks Pulsar Timing Array in Australia, I believe. There is a Chinese Pulsar Timing Array and there is the Indian Pulsar Timing Array. And um, all of them are using several different radio, radio telescopes to measure these pulsars spinning around. So why is this cool? 
because they can measure gravitational waves. And if I go back to the nice image here, the type of gravitational waves that you could measure with pulsar timing arrays based on our current understanding, supermassive black holes coming together or quantum fluctuations in the early universe. Okay. Pulsar timing array is not new. It's been around for a while, precisely for 15 years. We've had these telescopes doing this for about 15 years by now. Uh, can a black hole be split apart? It would be quite difficult because black holes are extremely massive and have a lot of gravitational pull. And if you try to pull anything out, it would just pull itself back together. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole. So if you try to split a black hole in half, it would immediately go back together. Like you would not have enough energy to pull things apart to split it in two. But it's fun to think about. Okay, so pulsar timing array has been around for a while. Nanograph, the one in the US, relies on two telescopes. One of them was the one that unfortunately we lost a few years back, the uh, Adesivo telescope which, as we know, crashed dramatically and is no longer in operation. But Nanograv also uses Green Bank Radio Telescope. So we have these, these different experiments working on pulsar timing array. A couple of years ago, I believe three, three and a half or two and a half years ago, there was a data release by Nanograv. Nanograv released their 12 and a half year data. So based on the first 12 and a half years of observation, here's what we have. And in that, they had a signal. They had something. This something looked like it was a background of gravitational waves, which is what we're hoping to find. Because based on how pulsar timing array works, it's very difficult to pinpoint specific sources. More you get just this background noise of gravitational waves. Um, in the first release of nanograph data, it looked like there might be this. But it wasn't completely clear, because there were some things in the data that didn't quite match what we expected. So the data was slightly the data was slightly off. And so nanograph, 12 and a half year release, the data was slightly not what we expected. And based on the data, there were several possible understanding interpretations. Number one was we found a family of supermassive black holes smashing together in the Milky Way. This is what we expect. It's just that the data isn't quite good enough yet to, to measure everything. But then anytime there's a bit of inconsistency in the data, uh, we lost one. Yes, the, the Adathibo telescope crashed very dramatically. It's an Earth-based one, radio telescope. And the dish at the top crashed down onto the telescope. It's amazing. It was um, catastrophic. But uh, unfortunately, we lost it. Nothing to be done about it. Yeah, it, I, I've talked about it before on the streams. It's um, not nice that we lost that one. It, it, yeah. Uh, if you look, if you Google for the uh, Adesivo telescope, you'll you'll find what happened to it. There are videos. It is not not a nice thing to watch. If if you like the telescope, which obviously who doesn't like telescopes? Uh, but yes, it was the one in Puerto Rico. Everything has a gravitational binding energy. You could plug in the numbers and find an energy value for how much energy you would need to rip apart a black hole. Yeah, one could calculate that. I don't think there's enough energy in the universe to rip apart a black hole like that. Just so nanograv, the 12 and a half year data, there were some things that were slightly off. And anytime the data doesn't perfectly match our expectations, it gives people a chance to play and say, what if my model fits the data? And a lot of people tried this. They tried it with things like cosmic strings. Cosmic strings are a network, a hypothetical thing that could exist in the early universe, which are basically gravitational defects. They're often called cosmic defects. And it's something that would be really, really cool because in the standard model of cosmology, you don't produce cosmic strings. But there's a lot of models where you could produce cosmic strings. And some people looked at the nanograph 12 and a half year data and said, OK, maybe, maybe cosmic strings fit there. Other people looked at it and said, maybe primordial black holes. Other people said, probably supermassive black holes, which is the standard explanation. However, the nanograv data didn't quite fit any, or none of these models could quite fit the nanograv data. And the general consensus, at least my, my impression of the general consensus that I don't speak for everyone, of course, was that we need more data. Let's wait for the next data release. Let's wait for the other experiments to, to chime in as well. And, and then, then let's come back to this. So fast forward to last week when Nanograph 
the NanoGraph collaboration, put out an announcement calling a press release, or not a press release, advertising a big announcement with their latest results being publicly unveiled in a live stream on the 29th of June, four days from now. And then the other pulsar timing experiment said, just to be clear, this is not just nanograph, we're doing a joint, a joint announcement. Four of the five cosmic strings are not related to string theory. They're both called string, but they're different things. String theory is this idea of uniting the quantum world with the gravitational world. And there you rely on like every particle is made up of strings. Cosmic strings, on the other hand, are like one dimensional defects in the universe that you could have this kind of network of cosmic strings. We've never found them, they're hypothetical, but depending on how you analyze the nanograph data. So out of the five ongoing pulsar timing array experiments, four of them are having a joint press conference in four days. They're not calling it a press conference, they're calling it a like release of results. What's their exact phrasing? Let me see. On, so this is reading from the Nanograph webpage. On June 19th, the Nanograph collaboration will be making a major announcement during a live stream event. This is in coordination with announcements by other pulsar timing array experiments around the world. So which ones are involved? So the ones that are involved are obviously Nanograph, the Parks Pulsar Timing Array, which is the one in Australia, the European Pulsar Timing Array, and the Indian Pulsar Timing Array. These four collaborations are making an announcement major announcement on June 29th. This is four days from now. So what are they going to announce? Well, I have no idea. I really have no idea. I am not involved in these missions. What the logical thing is, is that it's about 15 years of data by now. So it's probably the 15 year data release. So what's the explanation power of string theory and should it be called the theory? I'll come back to that. I'm not a fan of string theory. It should be called string hypothesis because it doesn't make, okay. Rant about string theory side. Let's focus on, on pulsar timing arrays for now. So nanograph plus the other three are going to have a major announcement as per their own words on Thursday, Thursday this week, a few days from now. It's quite likely, uh, they now, just going to be clear here, I do not have any inside information. Everything that follows is my own personal speculation here. I am not in any way spreading rumors or sharing stuff that I shouldn't know. I do not know anything. I do not have any inside information here. But it's quite likely that it's a new data release, 15 years of data, all four of them together. So what might they announce? What could they announce? Well, if we go back to this chart, there's not many options. I, you know, We're looking at the, the yellow one here, second from left. The, the most um, no, normal explanation, the, the explanation that would fit with all existing cosmology is that they found a population of supermassive black holes. They found gravitational wave signals coming from supermassive black holes smashing together. This would be amazing. It would be another test of general relativity. It's another way of studying gravity and supermassive black holes, which remember we cannot see. It would be amazing. But then if you want to get more speculative, have they found something else? Have they found something coming from the early universe? Have they found cosmic strings? Have they found primordial black holes? Have they found something I haven't even thought of yet? Maybe. We, we don't know. And there are people on Twitter hyping it up a lot. There are people involved in nanograph and other of the pulsar timing array experiments that are kind of hyping it up. They might just be, you know, excited about their science, which is really, really cool. But but there was somebody who put out a tweet saying 29th of June is going down in history books. Are they winding us up? Maybe. Am I extremely excited about this? Maybe. It could just be just, it's still exciting. It could be, here's our 15 years of data. We found supermassive black holes. This is really cool. But everything within the standard model of cosmology, we didn't break anything. Could there be something else? Could it be aliens? I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, put a, I put a post in our like work chat asking people, so what are your rumors? What's the gossip? Anyone know? And um, people are messing about and wrote back saying it's aliens. We do not think it's aliens. Please do not quote me on this. We do not actually think it's aliens, but we are joking. Like, why not? I don't know what they're going to announce. I really don't. It, it could be supermassive black holes. It could be something else. I cannot wait to see the announcement on Thursday. I think whatever it is, it's going to be exciting. And 
even if, even if their major announcement is we have found literally nothing, then that's exciting too because we expect them to find things. We expect them to find supermassive black holes. If they find nothing, that's also weird. So I'm excited. Thursday, 29th announcement. Something is happening. Is it space dragons? Maybe. Space dragons are always my favorite model. <coughs> okay, let me just go back to the questions. I don't think the Adesivo telescope is the one that appears in the GoldenEye James Bond film. I don't think it's that one. I think they used a different one for that one, but it looks the same. Okay, string theory, very briefly. <coughs> String theory is a model that tries to unite gravity with quantum physics. It is mathematically very elegant. It is something that makes a lot of sense mathematically, but it doesn't work in our universe because it needs 11 dimensions to work at least. And as far as we know, our universe only has four. We, by its nature, string theory cannot make predictions of our own universe. And then there's a debate of should it even be called theory if it's not making testable predictions? Do you like your theories to be testable or not? And that's the debate. But it's great that people work on string theory and it's really cool mathematically. But it's something that is quite hard to test because it doesn't make predictions that we could actually measure within our own universe. If you give us an 11 dimensional universe, we could test string theory. But we can't. So there should be a breaking news science channel so I would never miss these announcements. Oh, that's what Cup of Cosmology is for breaking science news, breaking Cup of Cosmology, breaking Cosmology news on Cup of Cosmology. Just don't break the cups. Uh, you saw an episode of, of Star Trek Next Generation where the two-dimensional life forms were heading into cosmic string. Yes, there is this episode that has cosmic strings and that has my namesake, Deanna Troy, actually be, being overly emotional. And we all joke about it in work, at work. So an episode that has cosmic strings and Deanna being emotional, it's fun. So yes, there is an episode of Star Trek that features cosmic strings. So we've had so many episodes of Star Trek by now that I'm sure there's one that features everything. Every time you hear someone say theory in, in movies, you correct it to hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, me too. Is there any combination of stellar activities that gravitational waves have not yet been have not been detected yet? So we've only found one case of two neutron stars smashing together. It would be nice to find a few more of those. And it would be nice to find a few more neutron star, neutron star collisions. We have a lot of black hole, black hole collisions, but it would be nice to find more things there. GoldenEye is on Wikipedia's list of its film appearances. Okay, so I guess GoldenEye was at a I, I mix it up with another one, but yes, then it is the radio telescope that appeared there. What is the lowest frequency that the pulsar timing array can detect? Um, let me just bring up the chart again. It should be frequency 10 around, well, it's in the nanohertz frequency, so about 10 to the minus 9 hertz, 10 to the minus 10 hertz. So yeah, around nanohertz frequency, that's where nanograv comes from. It's like nanohertz frequency gravitational waves. So it's around 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 9. So this is going to be very cool. I don't know what they're announcing. And I'm excited about it and hyped up about it. And I was already very excited and hyped up about it when they announced it. And then it, things got more interesting. And this brings me to the third thing of the week. So, so far, we've covered Euclid, 1st of July. Pulsar timing array announcement on the 29th of July. And now let's change gears and let's think about neutrinos. Given the frequencies, how long do longer wavelength gravitational wave observations take? That is an excellent question and one that I don't know the answer to. Um, no idea. No idea off the top of my head. I, I can't answer that. But yeah, given the wavelength, it's going to be different to LIGO and LISA, but I, have, I do not have those numbers in my in my mind. I could do a back of the envelope calculation, but it's not in my mind right now. Yeah, GoldenEye is one of the many, many, many films in which Sean Bean does the Sean Bean. So third thing that I want to talk about, neutrinos. Let's just change and go to neutrinos. Real-time follow-up, you can't calculate the the um, gravitational binding energy of a black hole because the formula has radius and it would blow up. Yes, exactly. That makes a lot of sense that you can calculate that. A full cycle would be painful for longer wavelengths. I agree. Seeing a full cycle, the longer the wavelength, the longer you have to observe, so then the harder it gets. But with pulsar timing, away, we do have 15 years of data now, so we have been able to observe for a while. Okay, neutrinos. Neutrinos are a particle that exists within the standard model 
They are extremely light. We used to think they were massless and traveled at the speed of light. Then we realized they're actually not massless. They have a tiny, tiny mass, which means they don't travel at the speed of light. There are three types of neutrinos in the standard model. We call them electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. Neutrinos have the several core properties. One of them is that they can oscillate. They can change flavor. You can produce an electron neutrino, and 10 minutes later, it's a muon neutrino, and then it's a tau neutrino, and then it's back to muon and back to electron. They can change flavor. It's like if you go to the shop and buy surprise ice cream, and it could be three different flavors, and you know it changes every time you open it. It's a different flavor. That would be really, really cool. Uh, you still find a Bond movie named after a duck a bit silly. <laughs> yes. So, neutrinos, tiny, tiny, tiny particles zipping through the universe are created in a lot of things, including in stars, in the sun. If you hold up your thumb every second, 60 billion neutrinos pass through the tip of your thumb. Why is this relevant? You'll see neutrinos are a really, really, really cool thing, and it's something that are ideal cosmic messengers because they barely interact. If something commits neutrinos, if we can detect them here on Earth, the information we get is kind of unchanged. Neutrinos are not deflected by magnetic fields. They don't interact with much. If you get a supernova and a burst of neutrinos, the neutrinos you're getting from the supernova contain a lot of information about the supernova itself. They haven't changed much other than changing flavor. Another cool thing about neutrinos is we have no idea how they get mass. Everything else in the standard model has mass because it talks to the Higgs boson. Neutrinos don't talk to the Higgs boson, and yet they have mass. We have no idea how that works. Neutrinos are really fun. And despite how difficult they are to measure, we have come up with ways of measuring them. Neutrinos can be their own antiparticle. So a neutrino and a neutrino can come together and, and annihilate in the same way that you could have an electron and an anti-electron come together and annihilate. Maybe neutrinos are their own antiparticle. We're not yet sure on that either. Neutrinos are difficult to study because they barely interact. Whatever you do to try to measure a neutrino, a neutrino is just going to ignore you. It's doing its own thing. But we have come up with amazing ways on how to actually measure neutrinos. One of them is hoping that you know a neutrino can interact very, very occasionally via weak interactions and then produce something that you can detect. For an example, a neutrino could produce a muon. If it's a muon neutrino, you can have it interact in a way that then produces a muon neutrino, sorry, a muon, and that's something you can measure. So we have built some amazing detectors to measure neutrinos, and my favorite one is Ice Cube. Ice Cube is one kilometer cube of detector, one and a half kilometers under the ice at Antarctica. So you go to Antarctica, you go one and a half kilometers down, you take a one kilometer cube, a one square kilometer cube, and you turn that into a neutrino detector. This is amazing. This is an incredible feat of ingenuity. There are over 400, about 500 different sensors down here. Sorry, 5,000 sensors. And each of these sensors can help reconstruct a neutrino. So if a neutrino passes through Ice Cube, which is in the Antarctic, it's a cube of ice under the Antarctic ice. It's amazing. And any neutrinos passing by, we can potentially measure them. And one cool thing about Ice Cube that I think a fun fact that I think a lot of people don't know is that Ice Cube is at Antarctica and the things you measure actually come through the Earth. So you're not interested in ones coming down from the top because they, they have atmospheric contamination. But the ones that come all the way through Earth and then go in the detector, those you've got rid of a lot of the background noise. So it's easy if, you know, if something's made its way all the way to Earth, it's probably a neutrino and not one that was just created in the atmosphere. Ice Cube can measure galactic neutrinos and even things beyond our galaxy. So Ice Cube has been working for several years by now. They've measured a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. They've measured a lot of stuff in our galaxy. And they have had, I believe, 11 extra galactic neutrino events. So neutrinos that were produced beyond our galaxy and carry such amazing amounts of energy, such huge amounts of energy, that they've made it to our galaxy and they collided in Ice Cube. So you're not trying to detect neutrinos, you're trying to tune out detecting everything else at the same time by mistake. Exactly. You need to get rid of everything else and that's why you bury this one kilometer underground, one and a half kilometers in the ice, the most pristine ice without any fractures or anything. You build your detector there. Maybe the Higgs boson is like the host of the party 
it's really boring and everyone only talked to them because they were obliged to and neutrinos and those figured it out and left. Yes, maybe. So Ice Cube has already measured a bunch of amazing things. It's given us extragalactic neutrinos. They have also been able to see that maybe some of the neutrinos are correlated with positions in the sky where we have gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts are areas of the sky where you have a huge burst of, N of gamma rays. We're not completely sure what causes this gamma ray burst. Might be supermassive black holes. We're not sure. But it seems like from the same region of the sky from where you get gamma ray bursts, you might also get high energy neutrinos. There appears to be some overlap. So Ice Cube has given us a lot of amazing things about neutrinos, including these extragalactic neutrinos, which is amazing. So now the fun thing. How do they know for sure that those neutrinos were from outside our galaxy? Based on the amount of energy they carried with them, you can figure out how far, and based on their oscillation, you can figure out how far they've traveled. And just mainly based on the huge amount of energy they have and the speeds at which they come, you can trace it back and say these have to be extragalactic. Also, there's a the thing of where they come from. If you consider that the Milky Way is like this, Earth is kind of here. If something is coming from a direction of the sky that is not where the Milky Way is, then you'll say, okay, the, you know, Milky Way is there. We know where the plane of the Milky Way is. If something is coming from up here, it's not coming from our galaxy. It's coming from somewhere else. 11 so far. Is a neutrino that originated for our way redshifted? It is indeed. Everything gets redshifted in the universe, including neutrinos. So just to put it in perspective here, the Large Hadron Collider, the one in Switzerland, in CERN that is smashing particles together, has currently is operating at 13 TeV, 13 tera electron volts. And um, let me just pull up something here. I want to find the highest energy neutrino measured by Ice Cube. Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. So remember the Large Hadron Collider was operating at 13 TeV. That was the highest one that they were operating at so far. And uh, with my results section. Okay, so the highest energy one they've been able to measure so far was, uh, where, where is this? Now I can't find the, the one number that I want. It's always hard to find the one number when you want it. But they have found ones that have tera electron volt energy. So single particles that have the same energy as the LHC collisions. So they've been able to find some really, really high energetic neutrinos. So why is this interesting? Why is this relevant? Well, two days ago, the Ice Cube Observatory, the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope Twitter account and social media and you know official press releases called a press conference on the 29th of June. Uh, the press conference is for a new result. So Ice Cube is giving a press conference on the 29th of June, which is the same day the pulsar timing array people are giving theirs. This is probably a massive coincidence. They are very different experiments. One is looking at gravitational waves. One is looking at neutrinos. They are very different experiments. It is probably a coincidence that these are on the same day, right? Right? But what if they're not? So 29th of June, 29th of June, not July, sorry, 29th of June, we get the pulsar timing array and the neutrino telescope announcements. Personally, I don't think these are connected. If they are in any way connected, then we have to answer the question of how could gravitational waves and neutrinos in any way be connected, which is why they're probably not connected. It's probably just a coincidence. What do they have in common? What they have in common is they're looking for physics beyond the standard model. They are looking for things that go against what we expect. You know, every experiment is hoping to find something weird. So, what have they found? There are a few small things that could possibly link two together, but they're so speculative and so beyond the standard model of cosmology and particle physics that it's very, very unlikely. So here's what I think is happening. And again, personal opinion, no inside information, and I would be very happy to be proven wrong. I think these two press conferences are unrelated. The also timing away people will have found a population of supermassive black holes and the neutrino people will probably have found a new high energy neutrino. That would be the, the scenario that fits in with expectations. But it would be really, really, really amazing if this is not the case. 
uh, a new dimension? Well, well, depends how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. You can find models that produce neutrinos and gravitational waves, and they are not models that are, are compatible with our standard picture of cosmology. So that is fun. There's a lot that it could be. You know, my expectation is that these are unconnected events, but it would be really, really, really fun if they're not unconnected events, but they are probably unconnected. I'm being very cautious about this here because I don't want to say anything and hype it up too much. In any case, you know, we do live in a bizarre timeline. Who knows what's going to happen? And there was this tweet saying 29th of June goes down in the history books. It is probably somebody just hyping it up and winding this up and, you know, having fun with the science, which is perfectly reasonable. But it's worth getting excited about. So three things to look forward to. 29th of June, which is four days from now, it is this Thursday, there's going to be a major announcement from Pulsar Timing Array, something's up with gravitational waves. On the same day, there's going to be a major announcement from the biggest neutrino telescope, one of the biggest neutrino telescopes we have on Earth. And a few days later, that uh, the few days later on the 1st of July, Euclid is going to launch. So this is all happening within the next week. So what's new in cosmology? Well, today, nothing, but ask me again next week. And who knows? Who knows where we'll be next week? Are they being broadcasting live? They are. They are indeed going to be broadcast live. And I'm so glad you asked this. So one thing, we don't yet know the time for the nanograv announcement. But here is the link in the chat for nanograv announcement. And it says, follow this site for notifications. And here is the official announcement for IceCube with the link to the live stream. They will both have live streams. There is no link yet for the gravitation and pulsar timing array live streams, but there is already the link for the IceCube one and the time. And of course, the Euclid launch is worth watching because we all want, want Euclid to do well. So if you want to know about the Euclid launch, here is the link for the Euclid launch. Three links. I actually remember to have my links ready this time instead of just promising I'll add the links and then never adding them. Are scientists baffled? Honestly, I'm excited. I'm, I don't see how these two could be related, but it's fun to speculate. I think it's a coincidence, but part of me really hopes I'm wrong about that because it would be so cool. But whatever they announce, it, it's always cool when, when, a new, when a mission has new data, there's new stuff to be found, there's excitement. And the people I know in Pulsar Timing Array are extremely excited about this announcement. You can just check out their Twitter feed and like do a, do a search on Twitter for Nanograv. The excitement is there. People are getting hyped. People who work on these experiments are getting them hyped. And something that I think is really cool is that I have no idea what is going to be announced. You know, there are sometimes things leak, rumors spread. Scientists are terrible at keeping secrets. So there are some times where these things slip out. And before announcements, there's already kind of a buzz in the community like this is what they're going to announce. I really have no idea what is going to be announced on Thursday from either of these experiments. Like I have no idea what is happening. I will find out along with the rest of you when the press releases go out, which is amazing. And I, I'm so excited. And I hope it's going to be worth the hype and the expectation. I will not be doing a live watch along. I will be watching it live, but I will not be streaming my reaction to it. Go watch the official announcements and then we'll do a, a cup of cosmology afterwards. So, yeah. Um, next week's cup of cosmology is going to be interesting because there's a lot happening this week. So probably the next time you'll see me will be on Sunday next week when I'll come on to discuss the result of these three events, the Euclid launch and the two announcements. Depending what they announce, I might just jump on and do a live stream straight after the announcements, depending what they announce, but it's unlikely. I hope I've hyped you up about this. If you ask me which one I'm the most excited about, it would have to be Euclid launch because I cannot wait for Euclid. But the Pulsar timing array is really cool. IceCube is always amazing. I, I have a soft spot for IceCube. I love that experiment. And at some point I was seriously considering dedicating, like in my undergrad, no, in my master's, I considered doing my master's degree on ice cube related things. And I was like, I, I want to get involved in ice cube. So yeah, ice cube has a soft spot for me. Other way around, I have a soft spot for ice cube. You know, it's a cube of ice, it's pretty solid, but I have a soft spot for it. 
So cool stuff happening. It's going to be an exciting week. There are often times where there's nothing new in cosmology. Today is not one of those times. There are three things happening this week, two on the 29th, one on the 1st of July, we hope. It's going to be a fun week. Make sure you follow all the announcements, see all the stuff, and tune into Cup of Cosmology next week for, for the aftermath of these announcements and events and seeing what's going to be happen, happening. Depend If I get super hyped during the week, I might do a bonus Cup of Cosmology, but in principle, you'll see me all again next Sunday. Exciting times, fun times, fun times ahead. It is it is going to be a fun week. And I have two days of work and then I'm on holiday. So I will schedule my holiday activities around these announcements because I have to watch these announcements live. It's going to be so fun. And that brings me to an hour and six minutes. This has been great fun. I hope I've been able to convince you that there is cool stuff happening and that it's exciting and whatever they announce is going to be really, really fun. I hope you're all going to tune into all of the announcements. Cup of Cosmology, we will we'll be back online next Sunday, same time as always, at 7 p.m. European time, Central European time, 1 p.m. if you're on the East Coast of the US, 8 a.m., sorry, 10 a.m. if you're on the West Coast. As always, there's a time zone converter on cupofcosmology.com so you can figure out when to find me. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. It's been great fun. I, I love talking to you about all of the cool stuff happening in the universe and in cosmology in general. So I hope I'll catch you all again next Sunday. And I hope in the meantime, you'll stay safe and take care of each other.